Hi everyone, I put together a very brief review of quadratic equations, functions, and a little bit on graphing those functions. I know some of you have had a lot of experience factoring quadratics, others have not, and also um, some of you have never seen the quadratic formula before. So I'm attempting to distill about 15 to 20 days of instruction into as short a video as I can. Um, so if you pick up some of the topics here in this video, it'd be great. Others may be a little bit um, foggy. Um, I would say the most important thing is to know how to factor at this point. And next year in Algebra 2, you'll learn a lot more about uh, quadratic formula and parabolas in general. Okay, so let's get going. So the first thing I try to do is um, kind of show you the difference between a quadratic equation and a quadratic function. Well, both of them are equations, um, so they do have an equal sign in them. They are both equations. Uh, a quadratic equation is generally describing a single variable. Um, and a quadratic function, function meaning input-output, almost like a linear function, would be a two-variable. Um, another thing that they have in common is they have a polynomial in them with a degree of two. A degree, if you recall, of a polynomial is the highest exponent. So um, they would have some kind of x squared term or any other variable squared term in them. So that's um, in both of these. Single variable for a quadratic equation, generally x, um, or it could be any other variable. For a two-variable quadratic function, it's usually, um, like many other functions, the independent variable is x, being the input, and the dependent variable being y, or the output. However, a quadratic function is a parabolic in shape, so it's usually describing real-world scenarios that have that type of shape. It could be any kind of projectile, a rocket launch, a ball being thrown. Um, it could be water coming out of a fountain. Anything that kind of has that u-shape um, and consequently often the uh, independent variable is t for time and the dependent variable is h for height and it would be the height of uh, the missile of some sort so that you'll see a lot those two variables used in a quadratic function the standard form of a quadratic equation is ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. You want to get everything over to one side in descending order of exponents. You've got two, you've got one, and really right here you've got an exponent of zero. And you want to get this all on one side and have um, the other side equal to zero. Now of course in doing so in order to be a quadratic um, well I should have mentioned that a is just a coefficient and b is a coefficient. So here um, they're just the numbers right in front of the x squared term and the x term. And c is just a constant. And to be a quadratic, obviously, um, this coefficient here cannot be 0. Otherwise, your x squared term would go away. Now, the function form, you're just going to replace that 0 with the second variable, y. So ax squared plus bx plus c equals y. So this is your dependent variable and it's dependent on whatever x equals. Okay, so what are some examples of a quadratic equation? Well, a simple one could be as simple as x squared equals 4 or uh, x squared plus um, 3x plus 2 equals 0. Or it could have um, Let's see, we could have no x term again and just say x squared, maybe 2x squared minus 10 equals 16, something like that. The main ingredient here is that you have a single variable and that you do have an x squared term. And some examples of a quadratic function, well let's turn all of these into functions. Let's say um, y equals x squared minus 4. Let's say um, y equals x squared plus 3x plus 2. We're turning all of these into functions now. And let's say that y equals 2x squared and minus 26. 
Okay, so in this case, we've got two variables. Um, numbers of solutions of a quadratic. Well, it could be less than or equal to two. It could be up to and including two solutions. Um, or it could be zero solutions, or it could be uh, one solution. So um, depending on what that parabola might look like on the xy coordinate plane, we'll tell you that. An example here of uh, two solutions, well, this actually has two solutions here. This x squared equals 4. If we, I know most of you would say x equals 2, the square root of uh, 4, but in truth, um, if I were to show those solutions, if I take the square root, um, it would actually be positive or negative 2 um, for this particular quadratic equation. Because if I square negative 2, I also get uh, positive 4. So that would have two solutions. Um, a case, this here is factorable. I hope you can see that. We'll talk about factoring in a minute. This will also have two solutions. Um, but let me show you something that doesn't have a solution, a zero solutions. That would be something like this, x squared equals uh, negative 1. If I take the square root of both sides, I cannot take the square root of a negative number. So that would be an example of zero solutions. And um, let's show you a, uh, a problem that has only one solution. Um, Let's say x squared. Uh, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to erase that here for a second. If I just write out this already um, factored, so if I had something like this, and of course you can multiply these binomials back together and see the quadratic. But in this case, hopefully you can see that there's really only one solution. When you put both of these factors equal to zero and solve, you only get x equals positive 1. So that's a case where we have one solution. Most quadratics have two solutions, and there are some quadratics that will have zero solutions like this one. Now, how does that um, relate to quadratic functions? Well, all of the solutions that we're talking about here are um, the x-intercepts. So if we graph this type of thing on the xy-coordinate plane, the reason why this is 0 here is because we've replaced the y with 0. And y is 0 everywhere on the x-axis. So here, I mean, it's the exact same thing. Um, you can have 0, you can have 1, or you can have two solutions. And these are all the uh, x-intercepts. And there is uh, cases where a par parabola does not intersect the x-axis, which would result in zero x-intercepts, zero solutions. Okay, um, so how are they related? Um, exactly what I just said, the x-intercepts arise when y equals zero. And let's just quick make a little graph of that. So x, y, every single place on this line here, this x-axis, y equals 0. So if we move everything over in a quadratic and we put over here where a y would be and we put that equal to 0 and factor and solve, we're actually solving for the x-intercepts. So here would be a case where we have a parabola. If we graphed one, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, here is a case where you have two solutions, two x-intercepts. Here is a case where you have one solution, where the, it's called the vertex, is sitting right on the x-axis. And here is a parabola up there in quadrant one. It does not cross the x-axis, and that would have zero solutions. All right, now how do we solve single variable quadratic equations? There are a number of different ways here, and I have listed them in my opinion in order of complexity. Um, other people may feel differently. My daughter, for instance, she loves the quadratic formula and she always goes straight to that, but I put this on the higher end of complexity. Um, so it is a matter of opinion. The first and easiest, simplest approach is just take the square root. Um, oh, you've been doing this for a long, long time. For instance, when we solve Pythagorean theorem for missing sides, um, but it is limited and it only works when there is no x term. So if you have an x squared term and you have some constants, it's great. If 
very simple, uh, but it's not going to work if you have that x term, so it's somewhat limited. Number two is factoring the quadratic polynomial, and this is pretty simple when you get used to it, um, but it can be limited as well. It really is only going to work for uh, quadratic equations that have solutions that are simple fractions or more like integers. Um, so it can be very quick and simple, um, but it is also limited. Number three is a technique called completing the square. And that is a method where we will um, try to be able to go back to this simple taking a square root by making, um, instead of a perfect square numerically, we make a perfect square out of an algebraic expression so that we can take the square root of both sides of an equation. Um, this could be maybe put over here for the most complex. It's a little bit tricky, um, but it is how we actually derive the final method here, which is the quadratic formula. Like all formulas, um, it is what it is, and you have to memorize it. Um, I am going to show you how to derive it, but it is co quite complex. Uh, but once you know it and you use it a lot, you're really just substituting in coefficients and constants and solving for the values of x if they exist. Okay, let's take a look at the first and simplest approach, which is taking the square root. If you want to take a square root, uh, you're going to collect the squared variable terms on one side of the equal sign and the constants on the opposite side. And then you would simply take the square root of both sides to solve. So um, here we've got the generic form, x squared equals some kind of constant a. You would take the square root of both sides. And there really is, and I, don't, I know we don't often show the negative uh, solution here, but there really is then a positive and a negative um, solution for that equation. So this is pretty simple. We can, um, I don't know, say x squared plus 2 equals 38. Subtract 2 from both sides. We're collecting those terms. And we get 36. And take the square root of both sides. And x equals positive and negative 6. Okay, simple enough. Uh, the next most used, and I really strongly um, feel that everyone needs to learn how to factor a uh, quadratic polynomial, is um, basically reversing the process of multiplying two binomials together. So let's take a look at my diagram here. This is something called algebraic tiles. And what I'm showing represented here is 2x, a binomial here. Um, here's 2x. And here's 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is 3. So we've got 2x plus 3. And over here on the left side, I've got 3x's here and just plus 1. So really what we're looking at here is 2x plus 3 times 3x plus 1. And many of you have learned FOIL uh, or just using the distributive property. But this is more of a visual representation of the geometric area that is created by multiplying these quantities together because these really are um, squares of x length. And these are uh, constants, 1 plus 1 plus 1. So if we look at um, 2x here multiplied by 3x, you get 6x squared, and you can count the, the boxes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So you're getting here, I'm going to erase that, um, you're getting 6x squared here for a geometric area. If we multiply the number 3 side length here by a length of 3x, then we're going to get 9x, and that's what we have shown here. We've got uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 x's. And we've got 2x here in length multiplied by 1, and we're again going to get 2x's. And I have them in the same color um, pink because those are like terms. And finally, we have um, 3, whoops, thought I had my highlighter there. We have 3. Uh, ones times one, and that is going to give us three boxes, or an area of three units. 
So we can add all of these um, geometric areas up together. And that would be the same thing as if we did, you know, the distributive property over here. And we get 6x squared plus 2x plus 9x plus 3. Well, generically speaking, let's look at what that looks like with the distributive property. Here I have a generic coefficient m, x, and in this case um, my m was 2, and I have a constant here plus r, and in this case it was 3. Over here I have a different constant in front of the x, n plus some kind of constant, 1. So what does that look like generically? Generically, we have m times uh, n x squared. Then I have m times q times x. Then I have r times n times x. And then we have r q. And you can see that here, m times q and r times n these would represent generically these resulting coefficients here, and we simply add them together to get, um, to basically to combine our like terms. So the idea um, behind this is to use this thought process in reverse to factor, because that's really what we're trying to do. When we start with some kind of uh, quadratic equation here, we want to go in reverse to try to find out what were these coefficients here and these constants in these binomials. That's what we're trying to achieve. So let's take a look at how we can do that. Now, the first thing we want to do, as I said, is get everything off to one side of the equal sign and have the other side equal to zero. So for this first problem, we want to get that 6 out of there. So we've got 2x squared minus x. Negative 9 minus 6 is negative 15, equal 0. All right. So we've got this uh, two numbers coming together here. We've got r and q, and we've got m and n. And so what we want to do is multiply these two, a and c, multiplied together here is going to give us negative 30. And what we want to do is find factors of negative 30 that sum to uh, b here. Actually, I should write that down. So this is ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. So in our case, a equals 2, b equals negative 1, and c equals negative 15 when we get everything over to the one side. All right, so if you look at this problem up here that we could go in reverse, we've got 6 and uh, 3. If we multiply those together, that would give us 18. And if you look at that, 2 and 9 multiply together to give you that 18. But then they sum together to give you B, essentially. Once you combine like terms, it will be 11. So let's try to apply that to our problem down here. We've got a times c equals negative 30. We want factors of those that are going to equal b, and in our case, it's negative 1. So, so let's look at factors of negative 30. We've got 15 and negative 2, we could say. And hopefully you could see right away negative 15 and positive 2, or uh, positive 15 and negative 2. Hopefully you could see right away that that's not going to give us anything close to, uh, let's see, one of these has to be negative. So we've got negative, positive 13. Um, hopefully you can see that's nowhere near our negative 1 that we're trying to achieve when we sum the two numbers together. Um, so you got to start thinking of two numbers that are closer together, and hopefully you can see um, you're looking at either positive 6, negative 5, or negative 6, positive 5. And um, this one sums to positive 1, and this one sums to negative 1. And negative 1 is what we're trying to achieve. So we're going to use these resulting factors here. It's like getting our 2 and 9 up here. And we're going to rewrite this negative x 
as a sum of two terms. In other words, we're trying to get back to this uh, pieces and parts up here. So I'm going to replace this um, negative x by writing here negative 6x. I'm pulling from this coefficient. And I'm adding 5x minus 15. Actually, I want to put that in blue. Minus 15 equals 0. At this point, you can see we haven't changed our quadratic. We just rewrote that negative x term as negative 6x plus 5x, and that's equivalent. At this point, it's called factor by grouping. So we're going to take out the greatest common divisor out of the first two terms and the greatest common divisor out of the second two terms. Hopefully, you can see that 2 and x can be divided out of these first two, and we would end up with x minus 3 plus, and the greatest common divisor out of the second, 2, is 5. So again, we end up with x minus 3. Now, if everything has gone well, these two uh, terms here are going to be identical, and you can see that they are. Since x minus 3 is being multiplied by 2x, and x minus 3 is being multiplied by 5, we can bring these together, and the distributive property allows us to do that. And now we have our uh, quadratic factored. We can put both of these equal to 0, 2x plus 5 equals 0, and solve. And we're going to end up with x equals negative 5 halves, and x minus 3 equals 0. And we're going to end up with x equals 3. So in this case, our solutions were not integers, but they were simple fractions. So factoring worked well enough for us. Okay, let's try to take a look at this second example over here. So we don't have to get everything over to one side. It's already been done for us. It is in standard form, so we have a equals 1, b equals 1, and c equals negative 3. So we're going to multiply. We've got a coefficient of 1 here. We're going to multiply that 1 times negative 3 and get negative 3. So we're looking for factors of negative 3 that sum to our b coefficient here, uh, positive 1. So negative 3 is a prime number, so negative 3 times positive 1, or uh, positive 3 times negative 1, that's all we've got. And if we sum them together, we get negative 2 and positive 2. There are no other opportunities here for factors, since negative 3 is a prime number, and neither one of these uh, sums is what we're looking for, b equals 1. So this is to show you that factoring is limited. Factoring is not going to work for this um, particular quadratic equation. And the reason is, is because the solutions to this quadratic equation are not simple fractions or integers. So uh, this shows you that you know factoring is very powerful, but it is limited. OK, let's now. And uh, find a way to make, rather than numerical perfect squares, algebraic perfect squares. So what is this all about? Well, as you know, numerical perfect squares are um, those arising from squaring an, an integer. So 1 times 1 is 1. 2 times 2 is 4. Negative 2 times negative 2 is 4. So we would call all of these types of numbers perfect squares. An example of a quadratic perfect square are listed here. So if you look at um, x squared plus 2x plus 1, if we look closely at that, we can see that x plus 1 times x plus 1 uh, is equivalent to x squared plus 2x plus 1. And we can write that in the following way. At the base is x plus 1 and it's being multiplied by itself two times. So x plus 1 in this case is being squared. Um, here, and hopefully that's easy or simple enough to see. OK, let's move on to this problem here. Um, as you can see, that first coefficient and last uh, constant here are going to be perfect squares. So you want to start thinking about what's the square root of those. 
course, the square root of 4x squared is going to be 2x. So here we've got positive 9. Um, so that's either going to be negative 3 times negative 3 or positive 3 times positive 3. And if you have a coefficient here in front of the x term that's negative, that should tell you that you're looking at negative 3. And so you can see the relationship here. You've got negative 6x and another negative 6x, which is going to give you that 12x. So the square here is 2x minus 3, that's the base, multiplying by itself two times. So that's a perfect square. All right, now this problem over here is a little bit different. So we're given 9x squared minus 6x, and we're trying to figure out what would that constant be to make a perfect square. Well, if you look at the pattern, well, first of all, hopefully you can see that 9x squared, you're looking at 3x times 3x. Okay, now what two numbers multiplied together are going to give a perfect square? And then we're looking for a relationship here where when we multiply these together, we're going to get uh, negative 6x when we sum them. So hopefully you can see that the perfect square is going to have to be negative 1 because we're going to end up with 3x, sorry, negative 3x here, and another negative 3x which will give us negative 6x. So to complete that perfect square then, it will be a positive 1. Hopefully you can see that when we multiply out 3x minus 1 squared, you're going to end up with negative 1 times negative 1 or positive 1 here. Okay, <clears throat> so how do we use this technique to reverse um, this multiplication of perfect squares? and use that as a way to solve a quadratic equation by just simply taking a square root. Well, um, let's go back and look. This was the previous problem that we looked at on the, on the um, previous slide where we found out that this was not factorable. So let's see if there's a way that we can make a perfect square from these first two terms. So we know this is not a perfect square. We can't find a number multiplied by itself that's going to give us negative 3, and then when we add it together, the two terms, we're going to get that positive 1. So first thing we want to do in this case is get rid of that, actually I'm going to erase, get rid of the negative 3 here, move it to the other side. So we end up with x squared plus x equals positive 3. And our task here is to try to figure out what is here, what could we put there to create a perfect square. Well, the way we do this, there is an algorithm associated with it. Um, to use the algorithm, you want to first make sure that this is a 1. And in this case, it is. If it weren't, we would divide everything out by that coefficient to force this to be 1. But in this case, it is. Next, we're going to look at this coefficient here, which is a 1. So we've got 1, and we want to divide that by 2. Hopefully you can see why that's happening here. We have these negative 6x and negative 6x that are creating the negative 12x. So if you could see that, we're actually dividing that by 2. Um, and that's where that relationship is coming from. So divide 1 by 2, and what do we end up getting? We end up getting 1 half. And now we want to square that. Um, so we're going to take that 1 half and we're going to square it. And if we square that, that's 1 fourth. So let's take a look at uh, what that means for us. We're going to add 1 fourth to both sides of this equation. And that's the uh, addition property of equality. Okay, so we end up with x squared plus x plus one-fourth equals three and one-fourth. Why don't we turn that into an improper fraction? That would be 13 fourths. Okay, now hopefully you can see that we have created a perfect square here. Um, what we have is x times x is x squared, and one-half times one-half is one-fourth, okay? Whoops, one fourth, 
And so when we do that, we get our perfect square here, 1 fourth, which is c. Now, both of these add together here. 1 half x plus 1 half x is 1 whole x. So hopefully you see the equivalency here. And, of course, we just got 13 fourths. Now, that uh, binomial is being squared. It's a base multiplying it by itself two times. So I'm going to write that as an exponent. Now that I have that perfect square, I'm going to take the square root of both sides. So the square root of this left-hand side is simply going to be x plus 1 half. And over here, I actually have the positive and negative roots here. So I've got the positive and negative square root of 13 fourths. At this point, it's probably easier to go ahead and use a calculator to find um, the square root of 13 fourths. And that is going to equal positive and negative. I'm going to also turn that half into a decimal since I'm going to be doing that over here. This is going to turn that into positive and negative 1 and 8 tenths. So solve for the unknown. x equals 8, I'm sorry, 1 and 8 tenths minus 5 tenths. And, and x is going to equal uh, negative 1 and 8 tenths minus 5 tenths. So if we figure this out here, we've got 1.3 or 1 and 3 tenths, and x equals uh, negative 1.8 minus half is negative 2 and 3 tenths. So both of these values, it does have two solutions in this case, and they are decimals, and that's the reason why we were not able to factor. Um, we, would, we could be working trial and error all day long and have a difficult time trying to come up with these values by factoring. So completing the square is a nice approach. Okay, let's try it again. So if you look at the algorithm here, we took b and we divided it by 2. And then to complete the square, we took that result and squared it. Okay, so that's what we did to complete the square. Now, as I said originally, this is only going to work if we force a equal to 1. So in this problem here, a is not equal to 1, so we have to force it to b. So we're going to get rid of that 2 all the way across. This is a 0 over here, but you would, property of equality would say you would need to divide that by 2. Okay, so we have x squared plus 5 halves x minus 2 equals 0. Now, we hopefully you can see that this is not a perfect square at all. So we're going to add, well, we're going to get rid of that 2 out of there and try to find a way to make it a perfect square on the left-hand side. So we've got 5 half x equals 2. And again, we're looking for what can I put in here that's going to make a perfect square. Well, b right now is 5 halves. And what we want to do is we want to divide that by 2. So we're going to end up with 5 fourths as a result by dividing by 2. And then we want to square that. So we want 5 fourths squared. And we're going to equal, or we're going to obtain 25 sixteenths. So that's what we want to add. We want x squared plus 5 halves x, we want to add 25 sixteenths. And if we add that to one side, we have to add that to the other. So we have 2 plus 25 sixteenths. Okay, so what is our perfect square over here then? We have x plus Uh, the square root here of this C, which is 5 fourths. That's our perfect square over here. 
5 fourths times 5 fourths is 25 sixteenths, and 5 fourths plus 5 fourths is 10 fourths, which is equivalent to uh, your 5 halves here. So we have that on the right hand side. And over on the right hand side, oops, I have 2 plus 25 sixteenths. If I had a common denominator, I could represent 2, a whole number 2, as 32 sixteenths. So 32 sixteenths plus 25 sixteenths is 57 sixteenths, if I did my math correctly. And at this point, um, we're going to take the square root of both sides. Since I have a perfect square over here, I can do that. X plus 5 fourths. I'm going to go ahead and now convert that to a decimal. I think is going to be easier. So 5 fourths is 1 and a fourth. So I'm going to write that as 1 and 25 hundredths. And at this point, it's easiest probably to go ahead and convert the square root here. Um, 57 divided by 16 take the square root. So we're going to end up with both a positive and negative, um, and that can round to 1 and let's say 89 hundredths. Okay, so x equals, let's take the positive, 1 and 89 hundredths minus 1 and 25 hundredths, and then we're going to end up with x equals negative 1 and 89 hundredths minus 1 and 25 hundredths. So what do we have here? We are going to end up with a positive root or a positive solution here of approximately 64 hundredths. And over here, we're going to end up with negative um, 3 and 14 hundredths. So we've got one positive and one negative root. And that is how you complete the square. Okay, so this whole technique of completing the square is exactly how the quadratic formula, and quadratic formula is kind of a proper name, so it is capitalized, I should say, quadratic formula. It's a formula like any other formula, like a formula to solve the area of a triangle, uh, area equals one-half base times height. It's a generic formula that you can substitute in values every time and obtain the answer. That's what a formula is. It relates multiple variables together and works every time. Well, it comes from, first of all, the formula is x equals opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a. And where does that crazy formula come from? It comes from completing the square of the generic or standard uh, quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. If we divide out and force that coefficient on the x squared term to be one, we're going to divide everything by a. Um, we're going to get rid of that c divided by a and put it over here to the right by, at, by subtracting c over a from both sides, and then over here we're going to try to complete this square. If we take this b over a and we uh, divide by 2, we get b over 2a, and then we square it, and we're going to have b squared divided by 4a squared. And we're going to add that to both sides, and over here now on the left, right here, we have a perfect algebraic square. And that algebraic square is x plus b divided by 2a squared. And over here, we need to create a common uh, denominator, which in this case is 4a squared, and then um, combine the numerators. At that point, we can take the square root of both sides. And I don't expect all of you to um, know how to do this, but I do think it's important that you know where a formula comes from in general. Taking the square root of both sides, we have x plus b over 2a, and over here we're going to have uh, the positive and negative solution of the square root of this. And at that point, we're just going to subtract b over 2a from both sides, and that's where the formula comes from. So I hope, you know, I know I went over that very, very fast, but I want you to just have a sense that this formula doesn't come out of nowhere. It's actually based on completing the square. 
So let's see how it works. And it does work every time. Even if you have a quadratic that's factorable, this will give you the integer solutions every time. So in this case, we have a, everything equal to 0 on the left. a equals 2, b equals 5, and c equals negative 4. And we're just going to substitute. So we have x equals the opposite of b, which is negative 5, plus or minus the square root of b squared, which is 25, minus 4ac, which is negative 4, all over 2 times a. 2 times a is 2 times 2, which is 4. x equals negative 5, plus or minus. We have 25. And we've got a negative times a negative over here. So we have 16 times 2 is 32. So we have 25, not minus, but now it's going to turn into a positive, plus 32, all divided by 4. x equals negative 5, plus or minus the square root of 57, all divided by 4. This time, you go ahead and take that square root using a calculator, and we end up with... Approximately 7.55, so we have x equals negative 5 plus or minus 7.55 divided by 4. And we can solve for one of those solutions. If you go through the math, x is approximately equal to 6,400. Oh, I'm going to erase that. 64 hundredths, and x is approximately equal to, let me find the negative, 5, uh, negative 3 fourteenths. Okay, so you could see here, and I think this was the same problem that we did on the previous page, you could see the quadratic formula is going to equal or it's going to work every time, okay? But it is somewhat complex to remember the formula. All right, real quick to finish up, what does the graph of a quadratic function look like? Again, a function doesn't have the zero, it has y. Um, so y equals this quadratic polynomial. y is dependent on what x equals. Well, when you have this x squared, you're either going to have a nice perfectly symmetrical upward-facing U or a nice, perfectly symmetrical downward-facing U. If we look here at this example, we have a quadratic that is factorable. Okay, so we would factor it. X times X gives us X squared. X plus... Uh, 5, we'd want to have positive 5 and x minus 1. So you can see x times x is x squared, 5 times negative 1 is negative 5, and then when we add the two um, terms, we get 5x minus 1x, which would give us positive 4x. At this point, we're trying to solve those x-intercepts, and x-intercepts happen when y equals 0. y is 0 everywhere on the x-axis. And so we would substitute here. y is now equal to 0, and you have x plus 5 times x minus 1. Put them both equal to 0 simultaneously. x plus 5 equals 0, so x equals negative 5. That's a negative. And x minus 1 equals 0, so x equals 1. And those are our x-intercepts. So we have positive 1, and we have negative 5. We would find this vertex here, the middle, by finding exactly the middle between negative 5 and positive 1. There are six boxes. So we would divide 6 by 2. That would make three boxes. So if I counted from one side three boxes, I'd add it negative 4, negative 3, negative 2. So right here in the middle, x equals negative 2. And we would find y by just substituting in. y equals... Uh, negative 2 squared, you're going to put negative 2 everywhere you see x, plus 4 times negative 2, minus 5, and if you go through the math, you will find that y equals 9, so that's where the vertex came from. And then it's always a good idea to find the y-intercept that helps us graph. Y-intercept, of course, happens when x 
equals zero. Everywhere on that y-axis, x equals zero. And so x, uh, sorry, the y-intercept is always going to be c, that last constant there, negative five, because when x equals zero, those two terms will just drop off. All right, so let's try it on our own over here to the right. We have y equals x squared plus 3x minus 10. That is factorable. So we have x. And how can we get factors of negative 10 that add to 3? We've got positive 5 and negative 2. And I'm going to put this equal to 0. So x plus 5 equals 0. x equals negative 5 x minus 2 equals 0, x equals positive 2. So we've got an x-intercept at negative 5 and an x-intercept at positive 2. The distance between them is 7 boxes. 7 divided by 2 is 3 and a half. So we're going to go from one end um, and we're going to count over 3 and a half boxes and we're going to end up with that it's called the line of axis, or line of symmetry, I'm sorry, is going to be at x equals negative 1 and 5 tenths, negative 1 and half. And so we can substitute that into our original quadratic, y equals negative 1 and a half squared plus 3 times negative 1 and a half minus 10. And if I did my math correctly, I think I get y equals negative 12 and a quarter. So that vertex is going to happen. I'm going to clean up my um, line of symmetry here. I don't know why it's not erasing. Okay, so... Um, we have negative one half and twelve and a quarter, so it's going to be something like right there. Actually, I'm going to put it in red. That's going to be our vertex or the minimum point. And then, of course, as I said, um, the y-intercept happens when x equals zero, so those would drop out, and the y-intercept is going to be at negative ten, c. So you can just take these points and kind of sketch your parabola. Thanks for listening. I hope this overview helps. I know it's long, um, but it's just a general overview of quadratic equations, functions, and their graphs. Thanks for listening.